then I'm, I was raised as a Christian, and I kind of never lived that lifestyle because I had seen hypocrisy from, you know, some of the elders in my life. But um, anyways, I heard of no fat because I was actually, I had a girlfriend, and I was experiencing the symptoms of erectile dysfunction. Mm. But I could still watch pornography, so it was very interesting in that way. I was like, why can't I sleep with this beautiful woman? but I can still watch pornography. So that's kind of the genesis. That's what got me interested in researching first no fat and then later going into monk mode, realizing that it wasn't just the sex that I needed to control, but all of my senses, like you said, the overeating or the overstimulation, the TV, movies, all of these different things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's such a, it's such a hit to the ego, you know? Like, I've experienced that in my life when you have, like, a woman that you love and you can't please her sexually because uh, the pornography is just messed up your brain. So it's like, it's like, you know, I, I always say that, um, you know, every short-term pleasure comes with a long-term pain. And inversely, every short-term pain comes with a long-term pleasure. So that's just one of like the long-term deep pains that you feel from in, in indulging in the gratification of pornography and fapping that you can't actually have a woman that loves you and respects you and feels sexually fulfilled by you. Like it destroys any chance of building a relationship and that's such a deep pain it's such a deep pain to have yeah exactly and that's why after watching uh, your webinar you know if i i kind of summed it up i wrote down some notes like you said will to god remember god often and to purify your thoughts and that really hit home man because if you think about it when we are overindulging you know being gluttonous you mentioned the seven deadly things or we are lusting over women we're not thinking about God. Right? We're just trying to gratify ourselves. That's why I like what you say. It's no gratification. It makes so much sense. And delaying that gratification and allowing us to actually work for rewards instead of just clicking the button, you know, that all really hit home for me. It makes a lot of sense as well. Yeah, man. Well, I'm so glad that you found some value in it. Really, I'm honored that it helped you in any way. And I really, that's what... I feel like, uh, you know, I'm slowly trying to, I'm actually tr actually finding my purpose now. Do you feel the same? Like for, for a long time, I was actually addicted to the uh, gratification of earning money. Like I would just involve all my work in trying to just make money, uh, um, you know, online marketing. Uh, you know, there's so many, the, the thing about gratification too, like there's so many things that will distract you from your ultimate purpose. And, uh, you know, for a long time, I was just like, oh, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell uh, um, uh, socks with uh, kittens on them online in order to, <laughs> in order to make money. <laughs> But then I would do that. I would spend like a couple of weeks making my shop and trying to sell these stupid socks. And then I'd be like, the f there's no point to this. Like, I just feel so empty inside. And uh, I would be jealous. I'd be looking at like the guy with the sock shop that has like thousands of followers. And I'd be like, ah, why don't I have a shop like that? But then I'm just like, in my heart, I'm like, this is so unfulfilling. Like, what, why am I racing? Why am I chasing this stupid dream? And uh, so, are you the same? Have you felt like like this is your purpose now? Like we're both running the same, uh, you know, business. Uh, do you feel like your know, monk mode health is something that you is purposeful? Yeah, man, a hundred percent. And the reason why I feel that is I've always had this uh, desire to serve, or I've always had this uh, feeling in my heart that I wanted to assist other people. But you know that thing, you got to help yourself before you can help others. So by me always being in a state of addiction, you know, I like how you said that, you know, you felt the pain of not being able to satisfy that woman or, you know, be able to give her what she wanted. And how I was feeling when I was living that life of addiction is I was always just trying to stuff things into a black hole that could never be filled. You know, only the light of God and 
God's love could fill that hole. But I didn't know that at the time because I was so in the world and of the world. But even when I was going through that phase in my life, I always did find myself very kind, very helpful to people, but I wasn't really able to help them. So now that I've found monk health, you know, mental, physical, and spiritual health, it, I'm definitely living my purpose. And I think definiteness of purpose is one thing that Napoleon Hill talks about. In an audio book that I recently listened to him, or by him, that was recently published in only 2011. So his family, his wife would not let him publish it. The next generation would not let him publish it. So Outwitting the Devil was published in 2011. Mm -hmm. And it's basically Napoleon Hill going through an interview, you know, with the devil. (laughs) He was basically interviewing the devil from his own uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. But one thing that the devil talks about is drifters. And the devil says he uses the things of this world or his tools to allow people to drift. And one thing that Napoleon Hill said, uh, you know, eradicates or gets rid of that is being definite in your purpose. So by eliminating these addictions or, you know, by going into monk mode, I have definitely found my purpose. It's so clear. And I have time to think about God all the time now. It's like a constant state of prayer, which leads me into even opportunities like meeting you, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so good. Very nicely put. You know, I want to I want to criticize Napoleon Hill though. He's talking about speaking to the devil and uh, the devil talking about making people drift. All right, so why did he write that book about trying to make money? In fact, he just helped uh, millions of other people drift by chasing money. You know, like I don't like I just now you know I I have this pain in my heart because. The self-help industry, it really made me drift, you know, that I, to this day, I look at self-help and I just hate it. I just hate all those stupid sayings, all that, like, you got to go out there, succeed. You got to brush your teeth in the morning and, and tell yourself you're a winner. And it's just like, shut up. Like that, it's all bullshit. Like you can't help yourself. No one can help themselves. Only God can really help you because when you have, uh, you know, when you have like a self sabotage within you, and, and you're addicted to gratification, how can you help yourself? You can't. You're you're literally drowning, and only by like holding on to the rope that God gives you, are you able to uh, withstand the temptations and the chaos of your own uh, self sabotaging uh, unconsciousness. So. It all seems, it seems clear to me now that, you know, that self-help stuff, it, it's actually, it misdirects people, misguides them a lot. A hundred percent, brother. And I just watched a video of a guy's uh, YouTube, this project Better Self, and it was talking about how self-help actually does ruin people because they just watch. But the way that I would tie that into exactly what I learned from you today and the main thing that I did take away from that industry, but I'm 100% agreeing with you, God first, God only, pretty much. But the one thing that I did take away from that is if you look at the title of the book, it says, Think and Grow Rich. So he was appealing to people's outer senses, like you just mentioned. But the one thing that I truly believe as human beings is we are what we think. And mm. that's why if we do purify our thoughts and we do focus on God, that's how we build the relationship with God, and then we're able to bring it out into this world, right? Because that internal world, that internal relationship with God, when you purify your thoughts, is then able to come out into the, the outer world. So that's the one takeaway that I did take from that industry, is you become what you think, and then from you, when you purify your thoughts and focus on God, that is how you end up finding the direction and the purpose of your life, how you're actually able to live it and sustain it on a daily basis yeah yeah absolutely it it does it you're absolutely correct there it does it starts with your thinking and it came and it became so uh apparent to me um during my no fap journey like uh i had at one stage i wasn't fapping but i just kept having wet dreams I, like every two weeks i would have wet dreams and i was like 
And after the wet dream, I would feel depressed and uh, unmotivated. And I was thinking like, how do I stop these wet dreams? It seems impossible. But when I actually really analyzed my thoughts um, and started to remember God more, uh, you know, I started to see that my thoughts were actually, I actually were having a lot of unconscious, filthy thoughts. And the, that was what was producing the wet dreams. And, and by purifying my mind, uh, I was able to, and remember God, I was able actually to stop that. So um, it's apparent. It's actually, it's, it's very real. And I think the no fap and the wet dreams is, uh, is evidence of that for sure. A hundred percent. And guys will ask me that too. They'll say, well, why do I continue to have wet dreams? And it's something that happened to me. And I can't remember where I heard this, but the person was saying, you do have to change the quality of your thoughts. You're mm. still lusting. And that's why subconsciously it's happening when you're sleeping because you haven't changed your thoughts. And that was really a game changer for me. So a little bit more about my story just to tie it all in is last year, I actually went nine months on this uh, semen retention no fast journey. And when quarantine hit, I was working a night shift. Um, so on my days off, I would be spending nights alone. And then the whole quarantine, and it just completely threw me off. But that's why I suggest to anyone uh, listening to this and all of the guys who messaged me on my page is you have to have a vision for who you want to be. And like we mentioned a few times, when you can align that with God, that is truly how you find your purpose and the person that you were meant to be. It's all laid out already. But once you've decided and you figured out that person that you want to be, you know, that will dictate what your goals are. And your goals will allow you to formulate a plan. And by having a plan, you know the routine that you have to execute on a daily basis. Like even simple things like the prayer or... You know, you said you fast twice a week. Those are all part of your routine, things that you don't have to think about to be the person that you want to be. Yeah. So by having that plan, I mean, I didn't have that the first time, and I still made it nine months. But now I think it's interesting when people say, good luck on your 90 days. And I know I'm going to crush that because I'm still connected to God this time, and I have a plan that I'm trying to execute so that I can live that purpose. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so cool, man. Um, you know, one, one thing I want to say is, and this is something that I've like recently learned, and uh, I think it's very powerful because it's, it's helping me chug along and uh, it's helping me actually keep continuing to work on my purpose is that, and, and I do want to ask you, uh, and I do want to ask you later how you did come to religion um, but first of all, you know, one thing that I learned recently is that, you know, it's not even, it's not even about being the man you want to be anymore. Like, even that's like, even that's not a deep motivation. Like sometimes, uh, you know, I would get so nihilistic that I would be like, I don't even care about that. Like, I don't, you know, cause let's say you become the man you want to be and, you know, like imagine the man you want to be like you. You have a ripped body and you have a woman or a wife that loves you and you have purposeful work and you're making tons of money and everybody respects you and everybody and you have lots of fame or whatever. Whatever it is that in your mind it is that that makes you satisfied with the image of yourself. Like, and then what? Are you happy? You're not happy. Like, only God makes you happy. Like, there's no situation like that will make there's no not even no situation and there's no person that will make you happy and even the person that you want to be that won't even make you happy so i have this deep nihilism but what's uh, what starts to motivate me now is that when you're on this journey with god like god becomes more apparent every day like when you remember god often and you're always thinking of god there's subtle movements of God in your life, like coincidence, coinc coincidence. I don't know how to say that word, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's like there's subtle movements of God that like there's things that shouldn't have happened, but happened. Like this, it was so unlikely, but it just seemed to happen for you. Like doors open for you that that shouldn't have opened. Like it seemed extremely unlikely, and you and you can see God moving within your life. And so when God becomes more real to you as your faith increases, 
Um, so do other things like the concept of hell and heaven. So when you actually find the re when you really have a strong belief in faith and and you can see the realness of God, you can see the realness of the hellfire and heaven. And so the fear of the hellfire becomes a huge motiva motivating factor because um, I don't know what it is in your religion, but in, in Islam, in our religion, in the Quran, it tells you many times like your purpose is to save yourself from the hellfire and then save others from the hellfire. And you know, if God gives you a wisdom, if he grants you like a wisdom, like your responsibility is to is pass the truth on, like you have to pass the truth on to other people. And if you don't do that, you might go into the hellfire. So now I'm like, driven by a fear of hell, like I just need to get the truth out there and save other people so I can save myself. So and that's becoming the motivating factor for me now, for me now. And uh, which is pretty cool, but scary at the same time. A hundred percent. And I would say some people are still beginners or they even haven't even really begun on their spiritual path. So when I say the man that I want to be, for me, I know I'm God's child. So I'm a servant of God. You know what I mean? It's very exactly what you just said. So as a servant of God, there are people in the world who don't believe. Or there are even people in the world who claim to believe, but they aren't purifying their minds. They're not praying. They still have these lustful thoughts. They just, like in Christianity, for example, they just go to the church every Sunday, but they're not living that life. They're not spreading the word. So sometimes, maybe even like Napoleon Hill, you do have to appeal to people's outer desires until they can figure out and come back around. Because for me, I don't push you know, religion on anybody, but I'm always willing to have conversations, and I'll drop little things about how it's affected my life, but there are some people that are going to take time, so the man that I want to be, that I figured out, is a servant of God, exactly what you said, and that's spreading the word, sharing the word, because at the end of the day, if you have the opportunity to help someone, which we do, by making them aware of God and having a relationship with God, that's not very hard to do, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And yeah, man. I have, yeah. So <laughs> in, uh, the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament, but it says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Right? So that's exactly what you just said, man. And by thinking of God and talking to people about that and letting people know, yes, God is real. And you can have a relationship with him as well. He's, he's searching your heart. He's searching your mind. He makes these things happen. But all you have to do is submit and believe, like truly believe, have faith. It was so interesting, man. Like, I, I won't jump the gun, but one of the things that used to really turn me off of uh, Christianity was just seeing the hypocrites. Like I said, people just go to church on Sunday. But then during the week, they're just living like, you know, in the Bible, it says the pagans. They're just living like everyone else. So that never made sense for me. But ever since I was a child, I always felt that strong relationship with God. And even the situation, you know, some of the pain that I've been put through, it's just him calling me back. And I would urge everybody, if you're in pain right now or you're lost, maybe it's because God is calling you. It's probably definitely because God is calling you. But you continue to ignore the message. You continue to go your own way. You continue to go the way of the world. And you really got to look deep in your heart. And that's why prayer, reading spiritual texts, fasting, all of these basic things that have been around for thousands, hundreds of years are truly beneficial. They're, they truly improve you because they bring you back to God. Absolutely, man. Wow, that's so well put. Wow, I'm really... Man, as you're talking, I'm like, man, you are like on the same path as me. And it's so cool. You understand uh, things that I understand as well. So it's so good to talk to someone that understands, especially when you live in a world where you're just like, am I fucking crazy? Like, am I, am I, the, am I crazy? Like, do, am I the only one that thinks this shit? But it's so good, man. It's so nice to talk to you. And uh, I want to say, you know what? Adding to that, 
That's right. Like God gives you the hardship, but then you know what happens with the between the believers and the disbelievers that I that I figured out through um, messages within the Quran. I think you guys have the same prophet, but one of our prophets is called Yunus. Maybe he's called Jonas or something in the, the Bible. Okay. And uh, what happened was he he was a prophet and he was spreading the truth to a, a city. And uh, he just gave up on the people. He just, he was like, I'm sick of these people. They're not going to listen to me. So he, he left the city and uh, he went on in a boat and he was going to leave to another city. And he went out on a boat to travel to the next city. And then a whale came in and swallowed him. And so yeah. this, this prophet is sitting in the stomach of a whale. And, uh, and uh, he's like, <laughs> he's like, oh, no. <laughs> He's like, they, they call it like the three, like he was in the three darknesses. He was like in the darkness of the, of the whale stomach. He was in the darkness of the, of the ocean. And, uh, there's another darkness. I don't know. I forget, <laughs> but, uh, he calls out to God and he's like, he's like, God, it's my fault. You are perfect. I am imperfect. Like, please help me. And so God helps him. Exactly. God helps him and uh, the whale spits him out onto the ocean. But the message of the of that prophet, like the story, underlying message of that story, um, of that prophet's life, is that God gives you hardship and then it's up to you to either uh, blame yourself and ask for God. You have to blame yourself. You have to be like, God, it's my fault. Please help me. Like, uh, I wronged myself. And, and if you if you can admit, if you can swallow your pride and if you can swallow the ego um, and blame yourself, God will help you and you become a believer. And But inversely, what happens is a lot of people in this world, they get hardship and then they blame everyone else. They blame God. They blame uh, society. And that's what you see with a lot of the time with lo a lot of the feminists and even the men, even the MGTOW guys. You know, they've been hurt by women or they've been hurt. Oh, the feminist, she's been hurt by a man. And so it's men's fault. Like men are toxic masculinity. Yeah, we need to kill them and stuff like this. Their fault. And that's what you're seeing today. Like everybody wants to blame their pain on someone else. But really God's giving you the pain in order to help you be more grateful. It's because you have an evilness in you and he's trying to help you help bring that out of you. And uh, so that's where the, the crossroads begin. Exactly. And yeah, we, it is the, the same story as uh, Jonah and the whale. And he was in there for three days. So it's the exact same story. Oh, you guys and have I it. Yeah. Lot, yeah, so cool. Yeah, jo jo Jonah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of it comes down to the, the one thing that I never used to believe in, but I'm a firm believer in now, is uh, marriage or even just being committed to your partner. Because, like, I came from a broken home, for example, and it took me a long time to come back, back to God. And I'm so grateful that both of my, uh, you know, grandmothers, they were firm believers, and they would always hammer that home for me when I was a child. But a lot of people don't have that. And a lot of these Nick Tao and feminists, I don't know their background, but I think it does come from not seeing uh, proper functioning relationships or not having you know, a male and a female figure in their life and showing them how those relationships work. So they do start blaming. But one thing that I've really been exploring lately, so in the Christian Bible, the book of Genesis, you know, the whole uh, Genesis is talking about God as a creator. And it says that man was made in the image of God. So if you just look at that literally, if man was made in the image of God, that means that we were creators as well. And the thing that I would kind of push back to people when they say, well, if God exists, why do all these bad things happen? Well, you explained it. We have that evilness inside of us. We have that sin inside of us. And God, because we are creators, God gave us a free will. Imagine a world or a universe where, you know, we had to bow down to God and we had to love God and we didn't have the free will to go our own way. Would we truly be happy? I don't. I don't know if he fully would, but even God, would he fully be happy knowing I created this being that could only love me? But when we come to God out of our own free will to love him and to 
be in a relationship that must that is satisfying. It's like having it's like being in an arranged marriage versus having someone that you find in the world that you love. You know, someone that accepts you for you versus someone who has to love you. So that's the one thing that I would push back to people is yeah, that evilness is inside of us, but God gave us the free will so that when we do come to him, it's satisfying for both parties that we did it. We chose that. That's what we wanted. And that's obviously what he wants yeah absolutely absolutely man that's 100 percent right and you know the the thing is like god he has the key he owns the keys to everything like everything you want he has the keys so if you want love you can only like get it if you love god like the thing is like why why people get pain why god also gives people pain and and breaks relationships up is because people love their partner more than they love god like they idolize like if you know a lot of uh, you know when i was younger there there was a the paradigm back then was that you shouldn't put one you shouldn't put a woman on a pedestal don't put women on a pedestal you got to be a bad boy you got to treat them like shit you got to you know you got to <laughs> disrespect them subjugate them they'll love it and then i used to do that and <laughs> and uh i they did love it but then i would just attract these broken women and would, and we would just enter these relationships and cause each other pain but uh you know the thing is cuz you it's cuz you put a woman on a pedestal, you shouldn't put a woman on a pedestal. Like you have to love God more than anything. Like that should be your number one love. And then if you love him more, he will give you the love of someone else, but you still got to love him as number one because you know, that that person's a human being too. Like they can't, they can't love you unconditionally. No one can love you unconditionally. Only God can. Only God has the most sincere love for you. You know, the second someone's angry or they're having a bad day, are they going to love you? No. They're going to they're gonna expect something out of you. So, you know, when, once you realize that too, is that, you know, if you want love from the opposite gender or in this world, you have to love God as number one. Exactly. And it's funny that you say that. Yeah, we were... We were always tell, uh, yeah, disrespect women, be the bad boy. And look where that got people. It got, it, how many single mothers are there out there now? Because they gave it the bad boy and then he left them when they were pregnant. And that's why I do firmly believe in marriage. Because if you were just, if you were just falling for someone's physical appearance, but you never even talk to them and you have similar values, like most of the women, I'm not going to lie, in my life before I changed, when even, they didn't believe in God at all. Like most of the women that I was attracting didn't even believe in God. Now, how could that relationship even last when deep down in my heart I knew that God existed? How could one parent be telling a child, yes, God exists, and then the other parent be saying, no, God doesn't exist? That's obviously going to create tension. And if you're just sleeping with someone for their physical attention, that is exactly why I'm doing monk mode, and that's why I'm showing everybody that it's possible. Because once you get out of this external world and fulfilling and gratifying yourself short-term basis, you start to realize what's important. And it's that inner work that we do through prayer, fasting, reading the spiritual text. And even in the Bible, once again, God told Abraham, you know, sacrifice your son Isaac. You waited a hundred years to have this son, but now I want you to sacrifice him because you need to love me more than you love anyone else in your family. And Abraham was willing to do that. So that's what I would encourage everyone to do. You know, one of the things I say at the end of my videos um, is I encourage you all to love one another because ultimately, if you think about it, how could we ever serve God? God has everything. You know, God has literally <laughs> the creator of everything. But we show our love to God, obviously, by remembering him. And like you said, by serving others, by reminding them of God, that is the ultimate service, I believe, that we could be for God while we're here, is reminding others of God and showing others, hey, look at, you know, basically this is my testimony, look at what God has done for me. But one thing that I would always tell people to be aware of as well is the reason why 
I don't I don't say my name in my videos or anything like that. I'm not trying to glorify myself because yes, I am a leader in a movement in a sense, but I don't want to be the face of it. Everyone can go on their own monk mode journey. Everyone has to spend that time and develop that relationship with God themselves. If you have men telling you about what you should be doing in order to get to God, it becomes a very slippery slope. And, you know, that's how a lot of the cults throughout the ages have started, by people falling in love with one man. Mm. And it is always about God. And, yes, we can do our part, but I don't want people to fall in love. Oh, monk mode help. Yeah, I got to follow this guy. Like, ultimately, I'm just trying to point you guys to towards God. And I just want everyone to remember that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not self-help. It's not... I, I'm not helping you, and it's not self-help. It's God help. Only God can help you, really. And yeah. it's a it's a process too. It's uh, you know, you can't you can't pick up a book and uh, read about patience and learn how to be patient and not fall into gratification. You can only learn patience by the trials and hardships that God will give you, and to be patient during those hardships. So it's, you can only learn the patience by living through those hardships. And, uh, you know, God, he will give you the hardships that you can pass. Like he gives you the tests and he knows your heart. Like he knows it's, he knows your limits. Like he knows it's possible for you, you know? So, um, only God can help you and he, and he can only help you through the trials that he will give you. And uh, so one last thing I'm going to wrap up the show is that I'm curious, man, like how, so how did it all begin for you? Like, how did you actually, when did you feel like the, like the light of God? Like, when did you feel like God speaking to you? Was there a specific time in your life? Man, honestly, ever since I was a child, uh, I, used, I, I went to Catholic elementary, but I kind of knew things were funny back then. And I think it was God just showing me how things can go sideways, but I always believed in God from the time that I was a child. A quick story that I'll tell everyone is, you know, doctors told my mother that she could never be, she could never get pregnant. You know, there was a physical thing going on that she could never get pregnant. And anyways, my grandmother would pray and my grandmother truly believed that my mother would have a child. And despite all of the other signs, I was born. So yeah. when my mother told me that, she never told me until I was an adult, but that really made me realize, man, I'm here for a purpose. I was like, I beat the odds. The, the doctor said I wasn't supposed to be here. I've always felt God in my heart. I've always felt like I was here to serve others. But what really brought me back, man, is just, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to fully describe it, but I went on a journey, so I was I was drinking a lot, I was sleeping with women, and so I'm from Calgary, Alberta, I'm from the west coast of Canada, and I had never really left Calgary, and I had one friend at the time, and his, his uh, family is a Christian family, his dad is like a doctor in theology, they're a very well-off family, but we were drinking all the time, we were smoking weed, I was smoking nicotine, all of this stuff. And then one day, God just kind of talked to me, man. I was like, I need to leave my environment. I need to stop doing what I'm doing. So basically, I, I got in my car. I took a Bible, just my car and my Bible, nothing else. And I drove to a city called Edmonton, which is the capital, which is uh, north. It's about a three-hour drive. And I didn't know anyone there. And basically, with my Bible... I lived on the streets for 30 days, and I would just read the Bible, and I would preach to people, to other people on the street. Damn. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the fact that God got me through that, when I had no plan, I had no idea what I was doing, is how I knew that my path and my purpose was to serve the Lord. And obviously things have definitely turned around in my diet. What happened though? What happened? So you you're preaching on the street. What happened? Like, how did you? Yeah, how did... <laughs> so I so I would read my Bible every day. So uh, Edmonton's a beautiful city. They have a river valley, so I'd go by the river. I uh, read my Bible, 
and then a lot of the different homeless shelters and stuff were run by Christians. So I'd be reading my Bible, and then people would be asking me questions. They'd be like, oh, the guy with the Bible. Like, nobody knew who I was. <laughs> and then I would just tell them the lessons that I learned, and it was literally changing people's lives, man. Damn. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had no vision, no plan. And I was like, if I can just leave my city and not know anybody, and all I had was this book, and some conviction, and I'm just changing people's lives. Imagine if I had a community of like-minded people. Imagine if we had the resources, the money, all of that. We had bodies. Yeah. What we could do to change the world and influence the world. So I noticed um, when I got back, so my mother retired, and you know, I spent about a year up in Edmonton. I got a job and blah, blah, blah. But when I came back, I started going on the internet, so I never really had social media or anything like that, but I started noticing, like, these no fat communities, and I'm like, man, these guys are doing semen retention, they're trying to get rid of their lust, but nobody is mentioning God. So, mm. recently, on December 31st, I was like, you know what, I'm going to launch monk mode, that's kind of like hard mode, where people go through the complete dopamine detox, I'm going to call it monk mode health, because it is this journey of mental, spirit, uh, physical, and spiritual health. But once I complete these 90 days, people are going to ask me, how did you do it? And I'm going to reveal to them it was God. It was my relationship with God that allowed me to get through it. And that's why some of these people continuously relapse because they don't have that support. They don't have the strength of God. And meeting people like you is the first step to building that community. And I don't want to say reintroducing, but if you look at the United States, it seems like a godless country right now. So we're going to be reintroducing, yeah, we're reintroducing God into the world, especially in these times when people need God and when people are so skeptical. And by just having the resources and the community and that safety, you know, and being true to our word is one of the main things as well. Men will always fall. Don't get me wrong. And that's why I don't want to be, um, you know, some Jesus figure. Men will always fall, always rely on, on the word. Always rely on the, the spiritual scripture. You know what I'm saying? Those are old and time season, the prophets, all of that. But yeah. uh, I feel like we have the opportunity to reintroduce God into the world. And by people being at home so much, they kind of have the time now to listen and to see, hey, what, what are people doing? Like, I'm tired of watching Netflix. I'm becoming overweight. I'm eating bad. People are drinking and smoking now more than ever. This is the perfect time to reintroduce God to the people, to the regular people, I think. You're right, man. You're right. You're so right. And uh, that was a great story, man. That was that was awesome. And uh, God bless your grandmother. That was cool. She was praying, and uh, your mother had a, had a kid. Yeah. And glory to God. That was uh, <laughs> really, he really did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he blessed your, he blessed your mom by having you. And uh, I think you're going to do great things, man. I think we all are. And, uh, you know, we're so lucky. We have a we have a big opportunity to actually do something purposeful in this world. You know, as messed up as the world is, there's huge opportunity to help uh, clean it up. And, uh, you know, we're so lucky to be in this position. And uh, God with us. Exactly. Hope, faith, and love, man. Carry those in your heart, in your mind. Remember God with hope, faith, and love. Yeah. And that light will shine through the world, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Man, it was so great talking to you. I'm really enjoying these podcasts and connecting with like-minded people. And, uh, man, I'd love to have you on again. Uh, I don't uh, – I'm so, I actually have anxiety now because I not – I always have anxiety if uh, the my mic was working or my video was working. So I'm praying that everything turned out well. But uh, I, yeah, I definitely want to uh, have you on next time. And, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, we have so much to talk about, I'm sure. Yeah, 100%. Maybe at the end of this 90-day challenge so I can show people, you know, with God, a basic thing like this 90 days is possible. And that's why I document it each day just so people can see the, the change or the transformation. Because I haven't really seen anyone do that, documenting their 90-day journey. They kind of just show up on the internet after 90 days and like, this is how no fat changed my life. But uh, I'm really trying to connect with people and uh, take people along. And yeah, 
the reintroduction of God, man. I'm excited. <laughs> Me too, man. Me too. You're going to do great things. And uh, I Thank hope, you. I pray that we can do it together. Us, nothing stop us, brother. So cool. So cool. All right, Cam. I'll talk to you next time. Stay in touch, please. A hundred percent. Thank you for having me on. God bless you, okay? It was an honor. God bless you. Bye-bye.